Hi, my name is Jeff Hilland. I'm the president of the DMTF and a distinguished technologist for Hewlett Packard Enterprise. And I'd like to present to you today the case for Redfish, why we did what we did and what we did uh, to create Redfish. A quick uh, note, this is a snapshot of work in progress at the DMTF on this date. So uh, th as things change, please see the uh, DMTF website for additional information. So if you look at the status quo before Redfish, we were starting with ineffection architectures. These architectures were 8-bit architectures built in the late 90s, and that was state-of-the-art back then for managing servers. Um, but it, it kind of uh, had outgrown its usefulness. Not that they were actually implemented with 8-bit architectures nowadays, but the APIs and everything that was designed for the interfaces was all built on that same standard. Um, and this increased development cost from using multiple incompatible protocols and tools and proprietary stuff. And, and um, we tried uh, some architectures after the 8-bit bit, uh, bitwise protocols, um, but those really didn't catch on. Um, as a result, there was a high barrier to entry. The protocols uh, all throughout the past uh, 20 years really weren't meant for humans to read. They were either very programmatic or bitwise uh, interfaces, and they required significant expertise to really understand them, as well as a whole bunch of tool development. So um, there were also proprietary protocols and OEM fragments and extensions where some customers would use an OEM extension and not realize this was meant uh, for a specific vendor's implementation. And, and even then, there was a lack of interoperability as far as some of the data that was coming across the replacements for those bitwise protocols. They also didn't have the security focus that we do nowadays. If you look at protocols just five years ago, 10 years ago, um, people were inventing their own security protocol. That's not a very wise thing to do these days. Let the security experts do that. And so um, some security issues had, had come up as a result. The architectures that were built 20 years ago were built for servers 20 years ago, which, you know, the bladed PC really hadn't come out of the out of the uh, uh, gate yet, and so those bitwise protocols really couldn't de describe modern systems, and the current specs didn't address uh, data centers at scale. The replacements for them. Um, ended up having so many associations and traversals and all that, they wouldn't scale well either um, just because of the number of IOs it took to represent a modern system. And so all of these were built with a bunch of tools that were great when they were first invented 10, 15, 20 years ago, but they needed layers to adapt them to the modern tool chain, special utilities and libraries and reformatting the data and how do you map it to a script and layers on layers that really, really represented just a, 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 a snarl of code to do manageability for servers. And then the inefficiencies in representing the systems resulted in a number of IOs that was astronomical to figure out uh, exactly what was in the system. So to try and do that at scale was very difficult. So we knew we needed to do some things to fix that, and uh, we decided to do uh, a, a couple of them uh, um, in pretty much order. First, we needed to bring forth a modern standard uh, that advanced the capabilities that were started by IPMI and the attempts at succeeding that with things like Smash and Dash. Um, which were more modern object-oriented, but had their challenges as well. We also knew we needed to take the industry leaders with us, uh, build a consortium, and bring the, the uh, um, industry leaders into an existing standards body if they weren't there already. And, and to that end, strive for broad adoption of the spec across the industry um, by getting a broad support from all the people that were, were as part of the ecosystem on the provider side, um, if we were creating an architecture that met customer demand, we knew we'd be successful. And then we knew we needed to seed the ecosystem with open source. Um, you know, GitHub and, and all the rest of the modern open source community that customers were using, we knew we needed to meet that tool chain with open source that matched up with whatever we did. And then attempt an unprecedented level of interoperability. We learned a lot from all these previous things. You know, watch the OEM extensions, make it extensible, but call them out and make sure customers know their OEM extensions. Strings aren't interoperable, but integers and enums are. All those lessons we learned, let's bring these into this new standard. And then we 
wanted to expand the scope to the rest of software-defined IT infrastructure over time because we saw people building solutions for networking and storage out of industry standard servers. And so we knew if we did the server part and we designed it correctly, we could um, potentially bolt it onto the rest of, of software-defined IT. And then keep that same set of principles going, and maybe we'd, we could extend it to things like power and cooling and other parts of the infrastructure. So we decided to reinvent IT management as we know it with a uh, um, modern industry standard. And that means uh, doing a couple of things. Uh, one, you got to intercept the modern tool chain. You know, don't make people do layer on layer on layer on layer. Look for what's in the libraries already. Look for the pro popular programming languages and support them. Um, you, we knew we needed to make it scalable and extensible. Uh, so, so make it purpose-built for managing software-defined hybrid IT, but also leverage the best practices of web-based standards and security models. Don't invent anything we didn't need to. Leverage it instead. And then make that payload human readable, but machine capable. So the guy doing a script and trying to figure out a problem can just read a web page like you could in a browser today. And yet anyone trying to build a large operation engine or deployment engine or trying to do things at scale should be able to do that programmatically. And then interoperability is the key cornerstone that really holds everything together. That's how you do hybrid IT is interoperable across multiple vendors. And that meant a hybrid IT management solution with a couple of design tenets. First, we wanted to leverage the common internet and web-based standards and other standards such as security where they were appropriate. We wanted to represent modern hardware designs. That's everything from standalone to scale out, current silicon, the stuff going on in open compute, um, everything in the, in the data center that was possible and outside the data center, if we could uh, come up with a design that allowed us to do it. All with a solution that does not require a PhD to design or use. And that meant separating the protocol from the data model. Use protocols that are out there today and then define a payload in them and allow them to be revised independently so that you didn't end up with this set of interdependencies between components. So we needed to have strong versioning and strong versioning rules and control. And that meant adopting the industry protocol suite. You know, everybody out there is using HTTPS and uh, SSL, and you can find those in, in the modern programming languages. SSDP from UPnP is is probably the widest used uh, uh, discovery protocol out there. It's used by printers. It's used by uh, Windows devices. And so if we used it, we knew we could at least solve that part of the market and leverage uh, uh, their best practices. Uh, do an HTTP-based alert description uh, uh, with a subscription model and uh, extend that to SSE over time. And then leverage OData v4 because that was at least a RESTful um, hypermedia protocol that was um, available in at least one OS. And that meant doing things with REST and JSON. Um, not that you're limited to JSON, but we needed to pick a payload we could all agree on. And uh, XML was uh, pretty verbose and JSON was becoming uh, the modern um, um, successor for uh, payloads in an HTTP uh, programmatic environment. They're modern standards, they're widely used for web services, and they're easy to use by IT professionals and amateurs alike, which is why we've seen success with those. And then do a data model description of the payload, of that JSON payload in that RESTful protocol, and make it schema-based. And let's start with CSDL and JSON schema, and you know, as, as schema definition languages become more popular over time, let's add those two. Um, because the market's going to change, and why should we limit uh, a customer from using it just because they use a different standard schema language? And all of that meant describing that easy-to-use data model that a human can just read and not have to go look at the schema uh, except for complex problems. And then create some new modeling design tenets to facilitate ease of design and ease of use. Things like inheritance by copy and polymorphism by union that are covered in another video. Um, those design tenants were important to the overall success. So why did we pick REST, HTTP, and JSON? You know, five years ago when we started all this, and, and you know, uh, it, it wasn't a necessary foregone conclusion. We were just seeing the crossover of JSON and HTTP. 
But as you see in hindsight, you know, REST is becoming the popular architecture, rapidly outpacing SOAP for a number of, of reasons, the, the meeting of the tool chain, the ease of use, um, HTTPS being the secure model of, of RESTful, um, clearly let somebody else do the security work and leverage uh, that work going forward. And then JSON is human readable. It's smaller than XML, so it's easier for programmatic environments in an embedded case. And there's modern language support. Um, not that you can't do XML, but we needed to have one payload we could all agree on. And so that combination of REST, HTTP, and JSON meant that you know we could uh, uh, meet the needs of uh, uh, the growing customer base for this kind of programming model. So we started the Redfish Forum in the DMTF, and we took a number of companies with us. This isn't the initial number of companies, but it's who's there at this time. Um, we've got the SPMF leadership companies, which really is a who's who of the system integrators and the device vendors and the people building the ecosystems uh, for customers to use. Um, between the leadership companies and the supporting companies and the strong chairs that we've got, uh, we've really got the right companies to help develop this kind of standard and carry it to the industry. We've become so successful with it, a number of alliance partners, and it's ever growing, uh, um, are joining with us to work on the Redfish standard to adopt it to the rest of, of hybrid IT. And you can read the list, list down there, but it's everything from the embedded environments to storage to power, cooling, and networking, and um, the list is growing. So exactly what is Redfish? It's an industry standard that covers software-defined management for converged hybrid IT. It's based on HTTPS in JSON format, uh, based on OData v4, schema-backed but human-readable. It's equally usable by apps, GUIs, scripts, programming language. It's extensible, secure, and most importantly, interoperable. And while version one was fo focused on servers, we needed to have a target that uh, needed addressing, and we were having customers having issues with IPMI over LAN, and so we had this ready when that became an important issue. So it could represent the full server category, rack mounts, blades, HPC, full racks of servers, future systems, um, and it was really intended to meet OCP machine ma management requirement, but also be extensible. And so that version one focusing on servers but with our eye towards expanding the scope uh, to the rest of IT infrastructure over time, let us develop an architecture that each standard could create its own area and then reference each other's area as needed on a case-by-case -case basis, allowing for aggregation and, and other advanced features as uh, Redfish became more successful. So, the DMTF is working on adding features about every uh, four months. We're working with other alliance partners to figure out, do they want to own their own schema and their own domain? Do they want us to publish it on their behalf? And so that's being addressed on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, we don't have a preference. Whatever anybody wants to do, that's the way we're willing to work. We like to try and publish all the schema on our site um, just because it makes it easy for developers, and we've made that real easy to do as well. So the timeline of Redfish um, over the past several years is, is before you now. Um, we brought a Redfish proposal into the DMTF in September 2014 and formed the SPMF. That group has now been renamed the Redfish Forum. Um, about a year later, the final specs were done. It took about a year of rationalization between the multiple proposals that came in. And since then, we've been on a, about a three uh, releases a year churn, adding new features and functions so far completely in a backwards compatible fashion. So we're just adding things that won't break existing code. In May of 2016, we added BIOS and local storage. Uh, in August, we added fabrics, including PCI and SAS and others, but the general fabric concept, as well as firmware inventory and update. And that works for software too. And then in December, we added advanced communication devices, those, those new NICs that are emerging that are multifunction, as well as a host interface to replace the uh, KCS interface that was part of IPMI. And then a privilege mapping to help those programmatic clients figure out what privileges can do what. 
In May of 2017, we brought in the first level of composability and came out with a work in progress for telemetry. Anytime you see WIP, that's a work in progress. It's a way of getting feedback from the industry before we make the final standard. Because when it came to telemetry, that started to matter to open compute and SNEA and um, the green grid. And, and so getting everybody on board with it was something we needed to do before we finalized it. In August, we came out with physical location and also did work in progresses for Ethernet switch, data center infrastructure management, that's power cooling, as well as a profile mechanism to allow customers to just say, these are the features I want, here's the profile, and feed it into the test suite to make sure that the solution addressed those. And then in December, we started adding, adding more advanced functions, query, where you can do expand and filtering and, and select. Um, the profile spec was finalized. We started to add FRU data. And in May of 2018, external account, how do you do LDAP and um, other, other ways of synchronizing account services? Um, we did apply settings, so you can apply things at time. We did server-side eventings, and we did another work in progress update for uh, Ethernet switches, um, DSIM, and then the metrics for telemetry. Um, and we're working on a work in progress browser as well, so that you can see these without having to um, unpack zip files by hand. And then uh, Alignment with other standards organizations, SNEA has released uh, Swordfish. They've got several iterations. They're following a similar model to the DMTF. We're working very closely with them. Their first release came out in August of 2016. We're working with the IETF to create a Yang Redfish mapping algorithm so we can do that programmatically. And then we've created work registers, registers with UEFI, the uh, uh, TGG, the Green Grid, OCP, ASHRAE, Broadband Forum, Etsy, NFP. You can you can go to the DMTF website for the full um, um, list of those because we're adding more and more all the time, almost every month now. If you're a developer, I'd encourage you to go to the Redfish Developer Hub. That's at redfish.dmtf.org. We've got a bunch of resources, mock-ups, and educational information out there. We've got schema indexes, a schema guide, the specs, and white papers are all out there. GitHub links for all the Redfish tools, the res registries that are out there for um, messages and permissions and other documentation are out there. Um, an ever-growing list of mock-ups is out there where you can look at actual payload and kind of walk through it link-wise as if you were viewing it in a browser. Um, and then we've got education community. Hopefully that's how you found this Redfish uh, video, but there are other Redfish videos out there as well. Links to the Redfish forum where you can go ask questions of the community that are the real responsive, and then white papers and presentations as well. So I'd encourage you to visit that for more information. Thank you for the time today uh, to present this to you. Um, and I hope you take the time to look at the other Redfish videos.